This is Jim Kiken, along with his service dog, Freedom. He is a highly decorated, 30-year combat wounded veteran and retired U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant Major, and former SCS-6 Director with the Department of Homeland Security. Today, Jim is my battle buddy. My name is Captain Bob, and this is Brews, Battles, and Bullshit. Hey Jim. How you doing? So glad to see you, man. Good to see you, man. Welcome to Decipher Brewing. So I know you're not around here, but Decipher Brewing is completely vet owned and I thought this was the perfect place for our wow, conversation. Wow, that's excellent. Yeah. So, so who are these guys? Bunch of crypto guys, three Navy, one Air Force. So you know that I like one of the four. No yeah. offense to the Marine. <laughs> yeah, no, no. The Navy guys probably run it. Actually they do. The Air Force person <laughs> never shows up. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> So this is the Sightail Stout, which you mentioned that you're not a big fan of hops, but what then is your favorite type of beer? A dark stout or a, oh, maybe a little bit darker, amber lager. So you're saying, wait, an amber lager is darker than a dark stout? No. Okay. I, I was always told growing up that the best stout is the one that you have to drink with a fork. Yeah, and I like, uh, I actually started drinking a stout uh, when I was stationed on Guam and uh, as a Marine, you know, and then we had a bunch of uh, British Royal Marines that showed up and we met in a pub downtown and they ended up inviting me to their ship and I was a little nervous about that, but they said, no, we have a pub on the ship. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> we gotta love them. Yeah, we went to, went to their pub and they had a room temperature, first time I ever had it that way, heavy, dark stout. It was excellent. The problem is they didn't tell me that their stout is a lot more potent than our stout and it caught up with me real quick. So you spent three years on Guam, you spent the majority of your time in the 30 years in the Marines over in the Pacific. Yeah, actually two years on Guam, um, 73 through 75, and then um, various other locations for various operations in the Pacific, yeah. You say various operations, but you ended up being the senior operations enlisted guy for all the Marines in the Pacific, which you told me previously, that was about two thirds of the Marine Corps. Yeah, um, after my, I was coming to a close of my 30 years and uh, the uh, Afghanistan war was getting ready to start. Uh, and they uh, reached down and, and uh, slated and then uh, appointed me. So they brought me in uh, specifically because uh, I was in the reserve at the time and they activated me because I was a senior executive in the government. So they figured I could help put together the forces when they started standing up Marine forces, built that up and then that's what got pushed into Afghanistan. And my job was to sit there in MAR-4 PAC, Marine Forces Pacific, and help build that organizational structure, put them all together and then push them into the war. That was my job. Very famously uh, with Iraq, it was the Marines that went into Fallujah right at the very beginning, and yeah. it was horrific fighting. Yeah. And you helped set up all those units well, it, from the Pacific. Yeah, I helped set it, up the stuff that went into Afghanistan. By the time Iraq came around, uh, that was not really uh, my bailiwick. That was someone else did that. I, I want to focus on your shirt, that you're wearing a Force Recon shirt for the Force Recon Association. Correct. We in the military know that, you know, all the special operators are badass and you can pretty much tell who's who because you can always tell who the ranger is by looking in the back of their car or truck. Yeah. Or you can tell who the SEAL is because they'll tell you. Yeah. But Force Recon is, is kind of the badass of the badass, but you were Force Recon before it was even Force Recon. Well, it was Force Recon back when I went in. It used to be amphibious reconnaissance and that was during the, uh, basically the Korean and first part of the Vietnam War and then it transitioned into Force Recon as the uh, mission changed slightly. Originally, the amphibious reconnaissance was to do, uh, you go and do uh, surveys of the shore and the amphibious landing area and all this stuff. So they were sent in to do reconnaissance before anyone knew they were there. 
they'd do all that, and then they'd go back and report to the force commander, and then they'd land their, their force. But force reconnaissance during Vietnam uh, evolved because now we had a land-based war going on, and they needed a reconnaissance deep in enemy territory. And I came in right during the end of the Vietnam War, um, and I went into battalion recon, which is, it, it reports to a division commander, and then later on transitioned into force recon later in my career, and that reports to the force level commander, which is usually a joint, um, joint force commander, and then whoever is, is leading the entire force, that's who those guys report to. When I first went into recon, I came back from overseas, and I'd been exposed to special operations during some things um, in the early 70s, got a taste for it, and decided I wanted to do that full time. So when I came back in 75, um, I kept bugging my commanders to send me over to Battalion Recon, which was right up the road there in Camp Pendleton. Just because you got sent to the unit didn't mean you were in. You had to prove yourself to the guys who were already there. And basically there's a program back then, it was called RIP, that's Reconnaissance Indoctrination Program. And it's gone through various name changes and they don't really tell you what it is. You know that you need to be in some phenomenal shape to even go and apply, but you have no clue what's coming because they don't tell you. So I went there and, and uh, showed up and they said, okay, well, as a sergeant, I was the senior guy in the RIP program because they wait till you got enough together and then they run a program. And so I had the honor of being the first one in the pipe without having any clue what was happening. So the first day they wake me up at, at uh, four o'clock in the morning and took me out. And I say, took me out to the beach. They drove in a Jeep and I ran alongside of it down to the beach, which is yeah, a mile or so down. That's not that bad, except they were kind of driving a little fast. Got down there to the beach and I'm wearing utility trousers and my boots and a t-shirt. And they told me take off the t-shirt. So I strip off the t-shirt, throw it in the sand and they back the Jeep up to the water and they take a big round rock. It's about this big. It's just perfectly round granite rock. I don't know how much it weighs. And they rolled it over the back out into the surf. Now it's painted black with real shiny black paint. Of course, when it gets wet, it's very slick. And there's a skull and crossbones painted on it with three little bullet holes in the skull. That's a typical recon sign. And it said, pick up the rock. Okay, I thought this was, you know, pick it up, put it down, one of those kind of things. No, it took me a while to muscle that thing up because I'm not a big guy. But I muscled it up, got it up, and I'm holding this rock like this, and it's breaking down my shoulders and neck and stuff. And they said, okay, run that direction and keep in the water halfway between your knees and your, and your ankles. So I started running, I'm gonna call it that, through the surf, carrying this big rock. And they don't tell you anything else. They don't say anything else to you. They just say, run that way. And then they pace you with the Jeep and you run. And I'm running and I'm going, okay, how long is this gonna happen? I mean, what's going on? Is there something? and you just keep running. They don't talk to you. And I finally passed out and fell into the surf vomiting. They told me later, I was laying there vomiting in the surf being washed around. And they pulled me out and I woke up in the Jeep on the way back. And they said, don't tell anyone about the test. Go inside, get, get cleaned up, go get some chow. Someone's gonna pick you up in an hour. That was the rock. I had no clue what that rock was all about. I thought, they're, okay, they're testing my strength. They're testing my stamina. Uh, about a year and a half or almost two years later, I actually took over that school and I ran it for a while and then I found out what that test is. It has nothing to do with your physical capability. They don't care how strong you are, how far you can run. It has nothing to do with the test. It's not a physical test. They wanted to see if you'd quit. There's some big guys that went through there and they ran a lot farther than me and they just threw the rock down and they were out that day. They don't care. They can make you strong. They can teach you what you need to know, but they can't teach you to never quit. So if you kept going until you basically passed out, you passed the first hurdle. There's a few more tests, and then you finally got past all those, you got into the training and actually started learning how to be a recon marine. That was the make it or break it. So the whole concept of never quit, I mean, you got to the top of the Marines, and at the same time, you're also senior within, it was Homeland Security at the time, or was it immigration first? And you were there when Customs Border Patrol transferred over? Yeah, I was there. I started uh, way back when as a detention officer driving the bus 
and then uh, worked my way up to Border Patrol agent. Did that for a few years, and then special agent in LA. I did uh, gangs and drugs and international fugitives, and finally got into counterterrorism. And then finally, it turned into uh, Homeland Security, and they brought me over. Homeland Security called me and asked me to go over to Iraq as the Homeland Security attache and country director to set up all the capabilities within Iraq that the DHS does here in the U.S. And then when I was done with that, I came back and they made me the director of the Middle East and Africa. So I was in charge of the entire Middle East, basically from what they call the occupied territories, which isn't, uh, all the way through uh, uh, India and Pakistan and the entire continent of Africa and the surrounding islands. Anyway, so I was in charge of all that for DHS and then uh, uh, retired out of there shortly after that. And it sounds like, because you were an SES-6, which I thought it only went to five, so you were the penultimate of, yeah, of it, what you could get in the Marines and the government. I mean, absolutely. Pretty much everything coming up roses. Yeah, I was very successful. So why do you have a service dog? Well, that's another story. So moving from the top enlisted operational officer in the Marine Corps to a level of immigration and custom of border patrol where Iraq basically had you come in to fix all their crap after the war. What happened? Well, uh, like you said, I was pretty successful in everything I did. All this stuff kind of caught up with me because I'd been in the Marine Corps for 30 years active in reserve and I got, because of my what I do, I got called back uh, a bunch of times, went to six different wars with the Marine Corps. All this stuff stacked up. Now, I've never had any treatment for any issues uh, because I, I, I've never gotten any VA treatment to this day. So everything I did was stacked up. I had no one to talk to and it just, it was, it was there. But you know, I'm a tough guy. I just tough your way through it, keep my mouth shut, uh, bull through it and keep going. But after a while, when, when everything stopped and I came back to Virginia and sat down in my house, it all came slamming home. Um, and all of a sudden, going from a high energy, high success, high uh, uh, functioning guy uh, to a guy who sat down in my chair in my front room and quit. I just stopped. Um, I didn't turn on the lights. I didn't answer the door. I didn't answer the phone. Uh, I didn't read books. I didn't turn on the TV. I just sat there. And that started in about 2013 and all the way through 2014. So a couple of years I was sitting there. And it wasn't that I was suicidal. I just had nothing left. There was nothing there. Did you have nothing left on the energy side, on the motivation side, or there was no purpose for you to go out and do stuff? All of that and more. I just really, there was nothing there. Didn't care about anything, didn't think about anything, didn't do anything, I just sat there. I didn't know how to get out of that, but frankly, I didn't really care. But luckily for me, um, I've always been a volunteer for a lot of different veterans organizations. I work for several right now. Always try to help my fellow veterans because, you know, as a senior enlisted, my job was always taking care of my guys. And you, you carry that through, almost everybody does, especially veterans, when they, when they leave the service, they carry through service to other veterans because you're always thinking about how can I serve my brothers and sisters? How, what can I do for them and help them? Well, I needed to help me, but I didn't see that. Uh, one of the organizations I belonged to at the time, it's no longer in existence, but it was a, a great organization at the time, Veterans 360. And uh, what they were doing was helping veterans with PTSD. Well, since I'd never received any treatment, never had any help, I had no idea I had PTSD and traumatic brain injury from being blown up all those times and all the other stuff that I had. I had no clue that all this stuff was, was stacked up. I didn't understand what it was. So I'd never been talked to about it. The organization I worked for came out with a survey. They wanted to see the quality and, and extent of PTSD a lot of these youngsters that were coming out of Af Afghanistan and Iraq were suffering through so that we could better serve them. So they put out the survey. Well, I was the vice chairman of the board. So just for the heck of it, I took the survey and sent it into uh, the chairman of the board just to see how I scored. Because now I'm starting to think about PTSD because I'm trying to help kids with it. 
I say kids, these are combat warriors, but a lot younger than me, but still combat warriors and they were having a hard time. And the next day he called me and he said, Jim, are you okay? I said, I'm fine, why? Typical, you know, I'm okay, I'm fine. He said, well, you redlined this thing, you maxed it out in every category. I said, uh, I don't know what that means. He said, you have the most severe case of PTSD we've seen in this survey. I said, but I'm fine. He said, I don't think you're fine. Have you talked to anyone about this? I said, no. He says, are you thinking about a lot of stuff? I said, well, yeah, all the time. I see things, I remember things, I smell and hear and feel things all the time. He said, uh, are you having any suicidal thoughts? I said, no, I don't, I never have. But I didn't care. And if I faded out, so what? I wasn't actively suicidal, yep. but I literally didn't care. I didn't even think about it. He said, you need to talk to somebody. Can you talk to somebody about this? I said, no, I, I can't talk to anyone about this. They wouldn't understand, they weren't there. That's a fallacy. I didn't know it at the time. So he said, well, have you thought about other treatment? I said, I don't have any VA benefits. I can't get any treatment. He said, well, how about uh, nonprofits? I said, oh, I never thought about it, never looked into it. He says, but you work for one. I said, yeah, well, I'm trying to help the others. He said, how about you look into something for you? He said, do you like dogs? I said, I, I love dogs. I've been an animal lover all my, all my life. He said, well, why don't you look into a, a service dog or something? I said, oh, I can do that because that got my attention because I like dogs. So I did the research online. I looked at all the different organizations and I settled on the one that I got uh, freedom from and because it always popped to the top. It was a top rated one in, in, in every aspect you could rate them in and in customer service, everything else. They were rated at the top. And Freedom, was, who is currently passed out under you, which is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, he's, he's watching but my back. We need to not serve the dog so much beer next time. Yeah, he's watching my back right now. Yeah, and he can't hold his stout. Yeah. I did the research. It took me a couple of weeks to figure out, because I'm very meticulous being a recon guy. I always try to check everything out. They said, well, you know, you have to uh, apply. You have to go, we have to do a background check and we have to do all this other stuff. I said, eh. They said, no, really, really, we'll help you through it. I said, because I just didn't have the energy to do it. And so they helped me and guided me through it. I did it, I submitted the, the package. They check you out financially to make sure you can take care of the dog, to check, look at your background to make sure you're not gonna abuse the dog. They do all kinds of checks on you. And they, and they also ask for a lot of medical issues that you need to provide so that they know what to train the dog to mitigate to help you with. Average wait time at that time was 18 to 24 months. They looked at my situation and everything else and they said, oh, we need to expedite this guy. And in four months, and that's the minimum bare time because these guys go through about a year of training before you and then another four to six months on your specific issues. So in four months, uh, I was in. They called me in November of 2014 and I already decided I wasn't going to see 2015. I was done with it. Um, and in November 2014, they called me and said, you're in the program. And so I started eating again. I started looking forward to seeing the dog and, and ended up going to the 2015 class and got him. Without him, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today because I couldn't get out of my house. I couldn't turn on the lights. I couldn't answer the door. I couldn't answer the phone. I was done. And so that's how bad it can get. You can go from the top. If a guy like me that was the top enlisted operational guy in the, in the Marine Corps and an SDS-6 in charge of a whole country and then a whole region can fall to that depth just that quick. Yeah, suddenly you're an old guy just sitting in the living room waiting. I wasn't waiting. I didn't, just didn't even care. Didn't turn on the TV, nothing. Just sat there. And if I can go from that height to that depth that quick, anyone can go through this and everybody needs to look out for their brothers and sisters. If it hadn't been for my, my brother out there who said, Jim, have you thought about this? Have you thought, about, if he hadn't talked to me, I wouldn't be here. All the programs out there, you were a vice chair to one of those many programs out there. 
50,000 VSOs, and it always boils down to your battle buddy yep. reaching out to you. If you don't talk to those around you, if you don't have someone talk to you, if I've found that to be true, and, and I've worked for many organizations now, and all of them do great work, but without that one or two folks that you talk to or someone reaching out to you, seeing that you're in trouble, uh, a lot of connections don't get made. Your buddy's name that contacted you, the chair? Oh. Just first name's fine. But your buddy's name that contacted you, the chair of the program? Chris. Well, then cheers to Chris for being a battle buddy because a lot of people don't understand that battles in the title is about battle buddies. It is. So, Jim, what's the, what's the future? What's the future for you? Now what I do, uh, besides helping out with veterans organizations and, and being a vice chair of another organization now, what I'm doing now is I'm writing a series of books that actually it follows a young person through his career and all his combat experiences, and it, it's, it's graphic. It is not kind and gentle in Hollywood. And it talks about his feelings. It talks about the... Uh, aftermath that he goes through and the, 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 all the different issues that he goes through are in the books so that people who have never been there can actually read this, see exactly what a lot of these folks go through, especially in the operations special operations community, and understand why so many of these folks coming home really could use a handout. You need to have the handout. And a hand up. Hand up, but hand out and shake that hand, bring them home talk to them. Don't be afraid to, to sit there and listen to them, to talk to them. A lot of them aren't going to talk to you, uh, and that's understood, but maybe they can find someone that they, they can talk to. It's all about relating. It is. Even if it means sitting down at a bar or a brewery and having a nice stout. Hoorah. Thank you, Jim. <laughs>